No more terrible disaster could befall your people than for them to fall into the hands of a hero. Paul Atreides is a hero. Aristotle's tragic hero, as written by him, is one that is first and foremost good, but not preeminently good, and whose misfortune is not brought upon by his own vice or depravity, but by error of judgment that leads to their misfortune. The tragedy of Dune, of House Atreides, and so many of these characters, is what Chani says to Paul before going south. She tells him that the world has made choices for them. Paul is both an active agent of his own demise and a victim of the wars and anger of the people above him, a product of the choices that were made by his parents and countless others, years before he was born. But it's Paul's own choices, the nuance of his character, that intrigues me the most. Ultimately, this binary of good and evil, hero or villain, sometimes doesn't reach someone who is hailed as more than a man and who is so clearly less than a god. Paul lives with this inherent duality, Atreides and Harkonnen, free will versus a fate ordained, outsider and Fremen, Muad'Dib and Paul Atreides, man and yet Bene Gesserit taught, his mother's plan against his father's heritage. Paul's relationship with his father, Duke Leto, differs from that of his mother, Jessica. In their very first interaction, Duke Leto ensures Paul that no matter what, even though he would obviously like for him to become the future of their house, that all Paul will ever need to be is his son. He doesn't ever push Paul into becoming anything more than that. He doesn't make Paul do anything he doesn't want to. And their relationship isn't transactional. In this short scene, their relationship is made clear. It's warm, it's loving. In the way that Paul looks at his father, and in the way the Duke caresses his son's face. It's different for Paul and his mother. In the first interaction between Paul and Lady Jessica, she makes him use the voice. In the interactions that follow this, she is concerned about his abilities, his dreams, and his future. There is a clear distinction between Paul, her son, and Paul, a candidate to become the one. And at times, she prioritizes her pride, trying to prove to the Bene Gesserit that she made the right choice, that Paul is a worthy candidate over the well-being of her son. One of the greatest tragedies of Paul's life is that his future did not include his father. Not to say that Leto was a perfect man, he really wasn't, but he was a man who at least respected the Fremen. We are a house of Atreides. There is no call we do not answer. There is no faith that we betray. But without Leto and house Atreides, Lady Jessica enters a survival mode and falls back on what she knows best, her training. To save her son, her daughter, and herself, she believes that the Kwisatz Haderach must rise. On Arrakis, Paul sees how the insidious agenda of the Bene Gesserit has taken root and blossomed among the people of the desert. How they can only look to a foreigner to save them. How this plot particularly allows for a Bene Gesserit plant to take control of their people. Paul actively berates and is against their plans over the course of both films. And with Chani as his guide, Paul begins to really understand how the Fremen have been handcuffed and colonized not only physically, but psychologically as well. Because of his successes amongst the Fremen, because of the Bene Gesserit, Paul begins to lose friends and gain followers. All because the Fremen resign themselves to the legend of the Mahdi and mold Paul into it against his wishes. Paul is adamant over the course of these movies that he is not special. And because the Bene Gesserit have done so much harm by creating this myth, they believe that he is exceptional simply because he knows how to put a still suit on without it being taught. Because he has learned and knows their language, he is then special. After he rides the grandfather worm, the celebration becomes worship. Paul, again, fights against this destiny, it feels like, but the chains of fate strangle him like a snake. Slowly, Paul has been losing parts of himself, small deaths. The loss of his father was a death for the man that Paul Atreides could have become. His father was a man of rational thought and logic, not a man of revenge. Your father didn't believe in revenge. Hell, I do. Paul has lost his father's way. The Atreides are all dead now. He succumbs to very human impulses and desires. He wants the Harkonnens and the Emperor to pay with Fremen support. But after this conversation, 
Jessica never desires to bring Paul back to the man that Leto would approve of. Either she doesn't want that man, or doesn't believe that man can save them. Paul's second death comes when he fights Jamis, and he takes a life for the first time. In the background, whether it's a djinn or one of these prescient voices talking to him, the voice says that taking one's life means taking one's own, and that Paul Atreides must die for the Kwisatz Haderach to rise. And before he can exchange steel with Jamis, the motif of the Kwisatz Haderach can be heard. Now going back to Paul and the things that he has lost, in the first film he was surrounded by so many people, so much love, he was grounded by it. Through his father, Duncan Idaho, Dr. Yue, through Firhawat, House Atreides was like a small community with a real sense of care for the boy and his well-being. They all meant something to Paul. Within House Atreides, Paul did not need to be anything more than Leto's son. But when all that is lost, who then is there to protect him? To help him? Who cares for him? The boy, not the myth. Without his father, he can't just be Leto's son. He has to become even more than a man. Now if we fast forward to the latter half of the second movie, he only has Chani. Stilgar goes from friend to worshipper, as did many of his Fremen friends. Jessica was once asked by Leto if she would protect him should anything happen, if the Bene Gesserit would, and she had no response. Again, this is a small death for the boy who needed friends around him, who needed people to support him, because now so many others with their own intentions push him towards his dark future. Gurney's revenge, Jessica's inhibitions, Stilgar's beliefs, Paul is starting to lose sight of who he is, and Muad'Dib is beginning to rise. All of these good traits that Paul had, his respect for the Fremen and their culture, his desire to not become anything more than who he is, in the face of power, all of this doesn't matter. In this story, power is inhumane, it is acidic, and it corrodes the soul and the person. The Baron, Raban, Fade Rautha, Lady Jessica, after drinking the water, becomes this harrowing figure. Her voice disfigured and her mind warped. Paul and the other Fremen are horrified at what she has become. The look on Paul's face here is heartbreaking. Paul now faces this temptation. And after Paul's vision of Chani, followed by the massacre at Siege Tabra that he didn't see coming, I didn't see it coming. things change, and quickly. Paul now seeks out power in order to protect the one person he has left. The one person who knows Paul Atreides. But Paul is hampered by his own humanity. Aristotle's tragic heroes are flawed individuals who commit, without evil intent, great wrongs or injuries that ultimately lead to their misfortune. And it's after Paul drinks the water of life that he truly dies for the final time. The director Denny Villeneuve mentioned how much he loves to use visual storytelling over dialogue. And without even speaking a word, Paul's transformation is evident. He goes from his usual grey, sand-filled still suit to this all-black garb, this figure that he feared in his dreams. The music that follows him when he walks to the hall is now aggressive and it's rugged. It's so much darker and more insidious than we're used to for Paul's character. This is a warning. The camera is much less intimate with Paul now than before he drank the water. We don't see any more of Paul's dreams or his visions. The future that Muad'Dib sees, the narrow path, we can only see it with his hand because it is his and it's his alone to see. We are not privy to that information anymore. He is no longer our protagonist and now we are watching him rise from an outsider's perspective. Where Paul was once treated as a man, just like any other in the first film and the beginning of the second, after drinking the water, he is now treated like something greater than a man. This shot of Paul walking through the crowd to get to the hall is fascinating, because it parallels when he walked through a crowd of people before. They would touch him, speak to him, greet him like any other. Now people scatter, and they make way for the Mahdi. And look at all of these people and no one touches him. In fact, Chani is the last person to actually touch him after he drinks the water of life, aside from Fade Rautha in their battle. No one in this crowd touches him, no one helps him up when Fade knocks him down, 
and no one lays a finger on him after he defeats his cousin. He is more than a man now. A lot of this film centers around Paul and his identity. You know who you are, his mother said to him in the first film. Chani tells him, you will never lose me, Paul Atreides, not as long as you stay who you are. To people who know and see a very different Paul, Chani loves Paul Atreides, she loves Uso, never does she call him Muad'Dib, not once. But Paul also tells Chani that he will love her as long as he breathes, and Chani sees Paul stop breathing. She saw him before he drank the worm's poison and afterwards. The next breath that the man in front of her takes is not the breath of Paul Atreides, but the breath of the Lisan al Gaib. So Paul becomes unrecognizable to Chani as he does to us, the audience. Paul begins to speak differently. His voice sounds deeper, more authoritative. This is my father's ducal signet. He is so sure of himself now and of what he is seeing. He even walks differently. He walks with a purpose, with swagger. Gone is the respectful, slightly timid Paul. For the first time, he proclaims himself as Duke of Arrakis. He accepts that he is their new master, and he has now embraced a future where he is the voice of the outer world. Frank Herbert wrote this story to be weary of charismatic leaders, and Timothy Chalamet absolutely nails this transformation from Paul Atreides into the voice of the outer world. And it's especially striking when you pair the scene of him speaking to the Fremen in the hall with Paul speaking to Dr. Kynes with many of these same ideas. His entire demeanor is changed, and his conviction is so believable. Watching the film, it's so easy to root for Paul here. You get caught up in all of it because of his charisma, because of his confidence. There is no confusion here. The smoke is cleared. The Harkonnens killed his family, and he is getting revenge with the people who also deserve it. It seems so simple. Paul tells his mother that they are Harkonnens, and the only way they will survive is by being Harkonnens, and Paul becomes one. He adapts their cruelty and disregard for life. The same kid who was so respectful towards the Fremen in their culture, who desired to learn all about them before he even joined them. Warehouse Atreides has no faith that they would betray, the Harkonnens do not. The Fremen used to drain their enemies' fluids because water was so incredibly precious. But in this war against the Harkonnens, the Fremen burned their enemies' bodies. Stilgar taught Jessica how important water was to the Fremen, how sacred it was. I'll never give your water away, not even for the dead. And yet, when it comes to prophecy, Jessica forces Chani to give Paul her desert spring tears. She not only takes away Chani's agency by using the voice, but she disregards their culture, as colonizers often do. And because Stilgar is such a devout believer of the prophecy, he and the others, they're okay with this. These Harkonnens have betrayed from in faith. This is no hero. But in all of this chaos, the prescience, the fear, I want to go back to the man, not the myth. Paul was dragged to this point, pushed into this future, forced to make so many choices. That's the tragedy of it all. House Atreides is given Arrakis by the Emperor, accept or perish. After his family is killed, Paul and his mother have no choice but to go into the desert. Paul has no choice but to kill Jamis or he dies. Jessica becomes a reverend mother because it's that or give your water up to the Fremen. In the first film, he was in that tent sobbing, begging for somebody, anybody to help him. He had seen this terrible future and he only wanted a way out. But no one, not even his mother in front of him, not even his future self, could steer him off this path. And then it was too late. No more terrible disaster could befall your people than for them to fall into the hands of a hero. Paul used religious fervor and fanaticism not to incite a holy war, but to gain revenge. And in doing so, he becomes a hero to the Fremen leading them to their inevitable doom. He becomes a legend, a demon. Muad'Dib is a name heard north and south. When he realizes that he cannot control the chaos of a people who believe that they have been finally given a messiah who will lead them to freedom from centuries of oppression, who deify and bend the knee to his every will, who will even commit unspeakable atrocities in his name, he understands that a hero can be a force unlike any other. Paul Atreides returns, 
for just a moment. When Stilgar asks him what's next, Lead them to paradise. But he says it with such sadness. He has realized the horror that is to come. The usual irony in Greek tragedy is that the hero is both extraordinarily capable and highly moral. And it's these exact, highly admirable qualities that lead the hero into tragic circumstances. Paul's hubris and his humanity is what places him in this position, coupled with the choices that were made before him and the addition of his will to survive. All of these elements play a part in creating Paul Muad'Dib. All of it matters. Did Paul want this? A holy war that will kill billions? No. Did he want revenge? Yes. Did he want to survive? Yes. The problem is that he believed that he could have his cake and eat it too. That he could defeat the Harkonnens, take vengeance on the Emperor by taking his seat and his daughter, but also free the Fremen from their oppressors and save Chani, all while staving off the holy war. And so the tragedy is that Paul becomes what he wanted so badly to avoid. Chani in the first film's narration asks who their next oppressors will be. And in the very next shot, the film opens with Paul. Chani has lost her person, but more importantly, she's lost her culture, her home, and her people. Paul Atreides is not a hero, but a cautionary tale. A tragic tale, handled with nuance. This film is a warning against messianic figures, as Villeneuve often repeats in his interviews. But it also places the Bene Gesserit at the forefront of it all, the prophecy makers, to illustrate how both the Fremen and Paul never stood a chance. The Bene Gesserit exist as both creators and executors of prophecy. How can you possibly have a chance against a people whose plans are measured in centuries? Paul Atreides, the man that he knew himself to be, whoever that was, no longer exists. I think it died along with his father and his house on that fateful night on Arakeen. And what a tragedy that night was.